Shatatata. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I was, um, I was looking through some of these questions that we've, that we've had, and one, there's one or two of them that I overlooked, even though I made mention of it before. But I thought this subject was settled. And obviously, there are some, if one asks a question, that means the others might have the same question. Because we teach this stuff all the time. We're on the subject of uh, tithing and so forth. And, and uh, so there's a particular question I think is worth responding to tonight. Well, you know, for the reason, for this reason, that you'll have some ammunition and some insight as to why we do what we do in terms of tithing in the body of Christ. Hello? Don't, don't, don't shut it down now. Don't shut it down because you know the subject. Oh, I know that subject. You might say that. And, but I tell you what, this is going to turn your, your it's going to ignite you tonight because we're going to learn some things and study some things that is very important for you and your success. And your, amen, and your growth. Hello, I'm not just saying that now. In other words, you'll never, ever, ever be broke again for the rest of your life. Come on, man. I, listen, I'll tell you that if, if, you, if, if you would just get the revelation and the understanding of the subject, the devil is a liar. He has moved upon leaders in this current era to talk against it as though it puts people in bondage. Absolutely not. It's a lie straight from the pits of hell. It is to rob you and take your foot from under you and to hinder you from prospering in the things that God has assigned for you in life. I promise you. And so when I say that, I'm speaking directly from the, 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 the truth of Scripture. You will never, and you can confess that every day, I'll never be broke a day in my life. If I ever get broke, it's because God's word doesn't work. I've said it over and over, I'll never be broke a day in my life. Remember what we talked about, you know, you know poverty is a, is a, is a mindset. It's a, poverty is a mental condition. Hello? You say, why? Because sometimes you, those who, who understand and live in poverty, often you would see their children and their great and their children and their children and their children, amen, living in that because that's how they think. Yeah. 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 I was told that it's a mindset that very few people recover from. Wow. And the truth is you might be broke, but that's temporary. Yeah. That can be fixed. Yeah. But a poverty mindset can't be fixed. You've got to be delivered from a mindset like that. And you know, you know people, you know, some of you grew up and maybe you, you uh, grew up in an, uh, a low-income environment or at the projects, and, and, and uh, I know people like that, of course. I, I was, I've been fortunate my whole life with my parents that we were always uh, well off, not, as I mentioned before, not rich or wealthy. But some people have grown up with it in the projects or a, a poor community, particularly the, products, uh, the projects, and then you find their children and their grandchildren, and it just goes up because that's the mindset. And they really don't have to be there if they're healthy, you know. They don't have to be there. It's just a mindset. And so if you understand this principle, you know, Pastor and I, we... We josh all the time, we talk about it. We gotta get the people to understand it's, it's not for anybody but yourself. It's a system that God has put in place to bless his people, and that's where it began. In other words, giving starts after. After your tithe, giving begins. Don't, don't shut me down, okay? Don't turn me off because I'm talking about something here that's important to every believer. Because when you, when you look at the principle, when you look at the principle, well, here's the question. I didn't mention it, did I? <laughs> here's the question. It says, people in this area have the wrong idea of tithing. This is, somebody's asking this question. 
See, they, they think that tithing is going to the church, paying pastor's salary, taking care of the pastor. They lack at understanding. Their lack of understanding is wrong. Like what the, see, this is written in Greek, I think. <laughs> oh, dear. But that's, that's basically the question. But here's, uh, and so they, they, at the end of it, they ask the question, says, please explain. So I think we'll just start this, and I don't know whether we'll get done to, tonight, but maybe we'll, we'll, I'll just take the time to go through the scriptures so you can take a real good look and let the Holy Spirit speak to you and give you real understanding. Because the moment you get understanding and you start acting on it, you will never, ever, ever, ever be broke the rest of your life. It'll never happen. It can't happen. Not because, and it's because of what God's promise yes. on the basis of this truth. Amen. Amen. So there, there are some unscriptural teachings on this subject right now. And it's a, it's a ploy of the devil to rob the church. Yes. I'm not talking about the building. Come on, come on. I'm talking about the people, the church, the people of God to rob you. That's, that's what he comes to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. So it, it, this, this, see, I know you're going to hear some familiar statements, but just to stay with me. Just tune in for a moment, and you, we'd learn some things together. Amen? Amen? See, tithing started as a principle. It's a principle that honors God. Don't be fooled by this, these uh, talks about being under the law. Now, you, we, we know, and most would agree, that it started with Abraham. But the truth is you got to go beyond Abraham. In fact, it started at the beginning, at the beginning of the human race. Are you listening? It started before Abraham. I, I don't hear many people talking about it, but it's right here in Scripture. It's so clear that I don't understand how we miss it, how we walk right over it. So I'm going to give you a few scriptures, and you'll see for yourself, and you will determine for yourself. Let the Holy Spirit tell you or show you how important this is, how important it is not just for you, but for God doing what he wants to do for you. Because if you want to talk about favor, this is one of the places that you start with the favor of God. You know why? Because what it does, it honors God. It's a principle that honors God. It's not a law. Mm. It's not a demand. It became a law after a while. We'll talk about that. But it's a principle that honors God. Amen. Amen. I was studying this a little while ago. Once I started hearing these erroneous teachings on the subject, and I started going back into study, the study of it, and I realized that under the Mosaic law, there's three, there's, there's, uh, there's three laws or three categories of laws under the Mosaic law. Uh, the law of Moses. There's, a, there's moral law, there's civil law, and there's ceremonial laws. Those are the three laws. And of course, you can go through all the detail. You see which, which is moral. They talk about do good unto them, uh, don't steal, don't rob, don't lie, you know, and adultery and all of that. That's moral. And then there's civil laws, how you conduct yourself among your neighbors and how to... You, you, we know what civil means, right? And then, of course, there, there's ceremonial laws where, they, where there's certain uh, things that they do. There's a big ceremony, and they offer up things, and they talk to God, and God comes in and, and pardon their sins. It's all ceremonial. Tithing is not under any of those laws. It was instituted in the law during Moses' time, but it does not come under the subject of any of those laws. It's a principle. And I say that, and I mean that. It's a principle. It honors God. It's a divine principle that honors God. So here, let's go back and take a look at Scripture. All right? This is your best answer to anybody that asks the question. Go, let's go to Genesis, the fourth chapter, which we're very familiar with. As I said, the beginning of the human race. Now, you know, uh, Adam and Eve had two of their two, the first two uh, children they had was who? Cain and Abel, right? That's, that's really the beginning, isn't it? I said that's the beginning, right? 
All right, so let's look, let's look at chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. You know, I like what the pastor says. He, he, he brought a salad, all right? He, he brought a what? An offering of the what? Of the fruit. He brought a fruit salad, right? Now, look at verse 4. Abel also. Everybody say also. also. Say it again. Also. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, you keep reading, you know Cain uh, killed Abel because of jealousy. But here, I want you to notice this. He said, what did Abel bring? He said he brought the what? The firstborn. Everybody say the firstborn. The firstborn of his flock. Now, we don't have any record that God told him to do this. There's no record that God has established that level, that law that says you got to give me the firstborn. This didn't happen until Moses' time. And we'll see it's a couple of scriptures. But here it is way back at the beginning. Intuitively, he knew that this is what he should offer God the best. Uh, and that's why it's called the what? The first fruit or the first, uh, firstborn. Firstborn is the first fruit of his flock of the f of, of, and of their fat. And the Lord respected it. Everybody say the Lord respected it. The Lord respected it. He brought the firstborn, which was a symbol of Christ. Because Jesus is said to be the firstborn among many brethren. It inspired God to the point that he, what he said he loved and he respected his offering. It wasn't even called a tithe. But it was the firstborn. Now, remember what it says, uh, what Solomon, Solomon picked this up, and what it says in Proverbs. He says to do what? Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of all your increase. Now, one translation said, Honor the Lord with the best part of everything you produce. I said the best part. You would think the firstborn is the best part. Honor the Lord with the best part of everything you produce. And this is Proverbs 3 and 9. Now, I see I'm camping here for a moment because I want you to see, intuitively, he had this is what he wanted to give God the best when his brother just brought what he had and it wasn't his best. He brought the fruit of the ground. Now, you can go deep into that, and, and, and you can go much deeper, but I'm, I'm dealing with just the tithe for now. There's a whole message there. I think Pastor preached on it a few times. Are you still here? So the best of the flock, see now watch, watch. He, said, he, he said, see Abel brought the firstborn, the best of his flock was a symbol of Christ. That's really what it was. And you know as well as I do throughout the scripture, Genesis all the way to Revelation, or let's look at the Old Testament, every book, every book in the Old Testament, there's a symbol in that book somewhere that talks about Christ. But, in other words, Christ is hidden in every book. And then you get to the New Testament is where he was revealed. Yes. All right? He was hidden. That's why we needed both, Old and New Testament. Yes. So we can understand the heart and the mind of God, why he did what he did. You go through all the books of the Bible in the Old Testament, and you'll find Christ in it somewhere. And we can go through that, but you, you, you take the time to do that. Huh? You talk about the seed of the woman. He's talking about Christ in Genesis. Exodus is the, is the lamb. And Le Leviticus is all about the priest, and it, it's, on, it's on and on. You can just go through it, and you'll see, you'll find Christ in it. See? So here it is. Intuitively, he brought the best. And that really God respected. In fact, hold your place. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's see what, God, what else God said about it. Are you interested in hearing what God has to say about it? 
or are you interested to hear what these preachers are saying? Okay. I don't know about you, but I'm interested to hear what God has to say. Because you know, the preachers can preach all day long. It doesn't matter. But if God's not saying it, I'm not interested in hearing it. Come on now. Come on. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's see what God says about this, this uh, Abel. In verse 4, Hebrews 11 and 4, it said, By faith, Abel offered to God a more, what kind of sacrifice? Excellent. Excellent. Stop there for a moment. Excellent. What does excellent mean? It's two words. It's a, it's a compound word. Excel means to go beyond. And L-L-E-N-T means cannot be improved upon. That's what it means. To go beyond that you can't improve any better. So you know when God created it, the Bible said everything looked, was good? It means excellent. That means like he couldn't do any better. It's the best. It can't be improved upon. So God looked at this, and God says, uh, Abel, just remember, he respected his offering, right? And here he says, and, uh, uh, by Abel offering, God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Interesting. So righteousness started way back in Abel's day, not just Abraham. Why, what was God looking at? He was looking at his heart. He was looking at his heart. He wanted to give God the best. And just watch this. Excellent sacrifice through which he obtained the witness that, that he was righteous. What? God testifying. Not, not man. No, no one else. God testifying of his gift. And through it, he being dead still speaks. God was testifying of his God himself. No one else. Because God saw the heart of what he brought to the Lord. And God said what he brought was excellent. Could not improve upon it. Mm -mm. Couldn't improve. It couldn't improve. Because it's the best. What can you do better than your best? Good is not good enough. The best is beyond good. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. And he, you see, what got me was, was the fact that God is testifying of this man. Yeah. And we have no scripture or no record of the fact that God told him to do that. Yeah. Cain could have done it. Yeah. Hello. Why didn't Cain do it? Well, go back to, let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to the fourth chapter. Why couldn't Cain do what his brother did? Verse 4, verse 5. Verse 5, Genesis 4 and 5. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Watch this. God's still talking now. If you do well, apparently he didn't do well. His heart was in the wrong place. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not, if you do, not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Huh. He said, if you do well, which means he had the ability to do well, but he didn't. Can you agree with that? Yes. See, when you start there, see, I'll give you this and then we'll get to it later. The purpose of tithing, the purpose of tithing is to show where your heart is. The purpose, the entire purpose, even, in, even under the law, it was to show that God's first in your life. Hello? Always, it means, it, it meant to be always means to put God first in your life. He said the firstborn. I said he said the firstborn. He brought the firstborn. That's the best. 
All right, let's prove it. Let's prove it. Turn to Exodus and 13. Exodus, the 13th chapter. And look at the second verse. Look at verse, let's look at verse 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast. Why? It is mine. Now, of course, this, hey, hello, hello. This is even before the law. The law hadn't come into play yet. And God's telling him that you will consecrate to me. That's God talking. All of the firstborn, anything to come out of the animals and anything to come out of man. Why? Because it is mine. Which means that first fruit, that firstborn is what honors God. It's a principle that honors God. In case you're still wondering about it, look at the 12th verse. Then you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the male shall be the Lord's. Is, is, is that good enough? No, it ain't. Let's look at one more. The 34th chapter of Exodus. Exodus in 34. Exodus, go to the 34th chapter. Hallelujah. Let's look in the 19th verse, 34 and verse 19. All that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep. That should be good enough. You, hit, you got two witnesses, you got three of them. I know it's, you said, it, you, do you have to go there? Yes, yes, I want you to see that God is still talking about the firstborn. Yes. And what did, what did Abel bring to God? The firstborn. What did Cain bring? According to pastor? <laughs> what a fruit salad. And God didn't honor it. But he honored it. He said he, he had an excellent, excellent sacrifice. Couldn't do any better. Boy, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm spending a lot of time here because I wanted, I wanted to drive that point in because that's what the purpose of tithing from the Old Testament all the way through is what honors God. And it, it says, it proves where your heart is. Amen. Amen. Oh. Amen. It proves where your heart is. Is he first, is he first or not? I said, is he first? Or, it proves where your heart is because your heart is where, where your treasure is. God knows that now. You can't fool him. I heard one preacher says, he says, you think you can give God whatever you want and say, well, I'll just give a portion of it just, just to show that. Uh, and, God, and he says, I like what he says. He said, um, you think God don't figure out what you're doing. And God can't count because he has a book called Numbers. He can count. He said that. That was funny, man. He said, God has a book called Numbers. He can count. So, <laughs> so you know you, you, you know, you can't fool God. He already know how much you got. Oh, boy. He already know what you brought in. Mm-hmm. Amen. Now, what we just read in Exodus, that is before the law ever came. Before God even gave him the Ten Commandments and all the laws of uh, Leviticus and Numbers and so forth. Are you still with me? Yeah. Before that. And so notice how God is honored by this first thing. He said, it's mine, it's mine. So tithing, here's, here, see, he said, well, how did tithing come in? Well, I'll explain that in a moment. Tithing is not, you see, the question was, uh, it, wrong idea about tithing that is, for, is going to the church, paying for this and paying for that. Now, wait a minute. Your tithing is what honors God, and it's a covenant that you have with God, not with the church. When I learned this, I've never, ever, ever in 30, 
seven years since I've been pastor, I've never, ever been broke, even come close to being broke. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. All right. <laughs> huh? Never, ever, 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 ever got close for being broke because of the principle that honors God. You know, you're not tithing to the church. That's an agreement. That's a covenant between you and God. Yeah, you know, there are times when it gets close. Finances looking a little dim. It's a little gray area, you know, and you start saying, oh, no, wait a minute. What do you do then? If you're a tither, the first thing you do is turn to God and say, Lord, I'm a covenant tither. And in your word, you made promises concerning the tither. In other words, I have tither's rights. There's such thing as a tither right. You have rights as a tither. I'm a covenant tither. This cannot happen. You cannot lose. This can't happen to this one. It can't happen even with your children. If there's an attack against them, I have tithers' rights. I'm a covenant tither. I, there's stories, that even my pastor shared some stories, where this, uh, his, his, um, his uh, granddaughter drowned in the pool. and She was gone for a few minutes. And the father and mother got out there. The father got out there, got her out of the water. She wasn't breathing. She was gone. They called the paramedics and everything, and she was gone. And he started to declare. Yeah. His, uh, he said, I'm a covenant tither, and you promise. He cannot destroy the fruit of my ground. That's part of your fruits, by the way. Your children are. Cannot destroy the fruit of my ground. My, it cannot fail. Cannot fail. Lord, I'm a covenant tither. And he keep declaring his covenant with God. That girl came back. She came out. Listen, she was dead. This was documented. When the paramedics, paramedics came, they said, she's gone. And he claimed his covenant with God. Amen. See, not just, not just with money, not just with finance, right. is with anything. Because he promised to protect us. He said, he's... Ah, he said, I will rebuke the devourer. Amen. Amen. Do you think that's devourer that is stealing your children and stealing your finance and stealing your house and stealing? Come on now. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God says, I will rebuke him. Now God steps up once you, he said, put me in remembrance of my word. Isn't that what the Lord says? He says, because I watch over my word. So you can claim your tithers, uh, your tithers' rights and believe God, and he will come through. See, you could, you could say, well, what about, well, it happened. I'm here, aren't I? And I've seen it happen over and over and over again. It's not, it's not, between, it's not, it's not between you and the church. And that's the mistake that most make. You see, this question was, uh, it's for the church and it's to pay bills. And oh, Wait, wait a minute, wait. All right, under, you see, th this principle, God inducted under the, the old covenant, under the Mosaic law. He brought it into the law, but it was here before the law. And so all this nonsense being preached that was is under the law, that's a lie. It's not biblical, it's not sound. God brought the principle under the law. And so when you read, when you, when you start reading what what's goes on, in fact, let's just take a quick look at what it says under the law. The purpose for tithing under the law. Let's go to Deuteronomy, since we're this close. Go to Deuteronomy, the 34th chapter, or the 14th chapter. Hallelujah. Am I helping you thus far? Amen. Deuteronomy, the 14th chapter. Look at verse, uh, beginning in verse... Uh, let's see now. Lord, help me. Choose this to make. Uh, let's look at the 23rd verse. Oh, let's go back to verse 22. Remember, this is under the law now. You shall, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. 
and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Ha! In other words, that's going to show where your heart is. It's called priority. Always put God first. This is why God is saying this. Now he continues, jump down, to, let's, let's go down to verse 28. It says, at the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. Why? And the Levites, because he has no portion, no inheritance with you, and the strangers and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hand which you do. So in other words, the principle or the purpose for the tithe under the, under the old covenant, under the Mosaic law, is not just for the Levites, it's for the widows, it's for the, amen, come on now, it's for the widows, it's for the strangers and the fatherless. Said so they'll come and, and eat, leave the field, 10% of it, so they can come and feast. But mainly it's for the Levites. The Levites was the tribe that did not get an inheritance, a land inheritance. Remember, there's 12 tribes. Eleven of them got portions of the land that was portioned out for them. They can, they can till the land, they can, they can have their livestock, and they can do everything with their own land. But the Levites didn't have one. God didn't give them any land inheritance. Their inheritance came from the tithe, the tithe of all the people people that brought the tithe, they get, they get paid and they were sustained from the tithes of the people. And that was the purpose for the tithe under the old covenant. Hello? Amen. Huh? So the tribe of Levi, which all of the priests came out of under the old covenant, yeah. the priesthood okay. came out of the tribe of Levi. God selected that tribe for the priesthood to come out of. Not just the, the high priest, but all of the priesthood. Are you still here? Yeah. All right. So they didn't, have, they, didn't have, uh, they didn't have land. They reaped their sustenance from what the people brought, the tenth. Are you getting this? Yeah. See, now that's, again, that's under the old covenant. That's under the Mosaic law. But then you go, then you can, you can go back now, you go back to Abraham. And we know the story of Abraham. We know that, are you still, are you still with me, right? I mean, you, you can see the picture here. See, you, you go back to the story of Abraham. We know what happened with Abraham. When Abraham came from retrieving his, his nephew, Lot, from captivity. Everybody knows the story. Let's turn there quickly. Genesis in the 14th chapter. I know you've read it, you know the story, but it's good to take a look at it again, all right? The 14th chapter of Genesis. And here we find, uh, we find where Abraham came from the slaughter. And every, everybody knows the story. You should, if you've been saved for any length of time, at least heard the message uh, on, on Abraham and Lot, the captivity of Lot being rescued by Abraham, all right? And you look in the 14th chapter, and then in verse 18. <clears throat> now, just, this, this is the end of it all. Abraham came back, took, he, he got Lot back, and when he got back, it says that then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. Who is this? Melchizedek. He was the what? He was the priest of who? The Most High God, or the God Most High. And then the next verse says, and he blessed him and said, this is the priest now. You remember the priest. Everybody say the priest. priest. Say it again, the priest. the priest. This is not under the law. This is Genesis. This is not under the law. He's a, he's a priest, a priest of God. And it says, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. 
And blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abraham, gave him a tenth of all. That's where the tithe, the, the word itself, came in. Now, did God, where, where did Abraham get this from? Where did he get it from? It wasn't a law. He gave who? The priests, the tenth. And verse 20, 21, Now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons and take the good for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. And I will, I will take nothing from, the, from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abraham rich. And now you can keep reading, but I want you to see what... We, we, we know the story, and then I'll just develop it here a bit. If, if you would look here where it says Abraham came to Melchizedek. Now, we read about Melchizedek, and you, you, for the sake of, of understanding this so you can explain it to someone. In Melchizedek, the person Melchizedek, we find a description of him in the New Testament, Paul describing who this man was. So let's go over there to the seventh chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7. I'm st you're still with me, right? And you're not bored. <laughs> All right. Hebrews, the seventh chapter. All right. Somebody says, well, this is not, uh, well, yeah, it, this, this is it's Paul writing to the, the Hebrew saints. And here in the seventh chapter, in verse 1, for this, now he's beginning to explain who this Melchizedek is. He said, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, you know what we believe, and you, we will just express it a little bit further tonight. He said he's, he was made like what? The Son of God. How? Wait a minute, wait a minute. He didn't have a beginning. He didn't have an end. There's no mother. There's no father. There's no record of it. But yet it says that he was, he was made like the Son of God and he remains a priest forever. He remains a what? A priest forever. Everybody say forever. forever. Not just in that day. Not just in the day of Abraham. Forever means what? Forever. Even today. No mother, no father, no beginning, no end. Well, when you look at the priesthood, in the Levitical priesthood, every single one of them had a genealogy. They told you who was their father, who was their mother, who was their forefathers, every one of them. They had a genealogy. But yet this man didn't have any. He showed up and he exited, never heard from him again. Mm, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And it says he didn't have beginning of days, neither at end of life. No beginning. It sounds familiar, huh? He's the first and the last. The Alpha and Omega. <laughs> the beginning and the end. Sounds familiar. So Paul is trying to get over to them. Listen, man, this, this is the revelation that he received from the Lord. And it's called king of righteousness and king of peace. No priest, no priest in the entire Bible carries those two titles at the same time. The only one that carries this title is Jesus himself. Righteousness and, and king of righteousness and king of peace, no priest carries those titles. Only Jesus. 
only Christ. He's, 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 he's sending a message here. I said, Paul is sending a message here. And he says, he's a priest forever, forever. A priest continually forever. Mmm. You start getting the picture, right? Verse 4, now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Consider how great this man was. Verse 5, and indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, remember Levi is the priesthood, who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithe from the people according to the law. That is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, speaking of Melchizedek, received tithe from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. Now beyond all contradictions, the lesser is blessed by the better. Stop right there. Whoa! The lesser, he's talking, to, wait a minute. He's talking to the Jews here. He's talking to the Hebrew saints. Abraham is their father, the father of faith. They all claim that we're the seed of Abraham. And how could he say the lesser is blessed by the better? In other words, he's calling Abraham the lesser. Is blessed by the better. That's Melchizedek. Now that kind of blew their minds. Because they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is this Melchizedek? We know Abraham. He's a father of faith. The lesser is blessed by the better? You call an Abraham the lesser and Melchizedek the better? Yes, 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 yes. Is everybody getting this, right? He says he's, his, his genealogy didn't come from, uh, uh, he didn't, it didn't come from the Levitical priesthood. Now, stop here. You know, you, you, you know six times... God himself make reference to Jesus as being the priest after the order of Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. Six times he mentioned it. He says, you're not a priest after the Levitical priesthood. You're the priest after the order of Melchizedek. What is that? Never show, never, no mother, no father, no beginning, no end, no genealogy. Oh, Wow. Hallelujah. And see, look at verse 7. Now, beyond all contradictions, the less is blessed than the better. Verse 8. Here mortal men receive tithe, but there he receives them of whom it is written that he lives. Man, he, well, we, we just read up here. He's a priest continually, yes. forever. Yes. Way back then. He still is to this day. If it's forever, it means forever. To this day. And then verse 9 says, even Levi who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. Why? Because for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Amen. Uh, it's, 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 it, it, that's not too much for you to grab, is it? Now, some of you looking, I can tell it on your face. <laughs> Levi, who's the true priesthood, they were paying tithes while they were still in the loins of Abraham because they came out of Abraham. That's what he said. He said, so to speak. In other words, he's saying, look, man, they were still in the loins of Abraham, and they paid tithe. I didn't say it. They said it right there. Verse 9, even Levi, who received tithe, talking about under the law, they received tithe under the law, paid tithe through Abraham, so to speak. Abraham was before the law ever came. And notice how he said, so to speak. In other words, catch it, gentlemen. Catch it, ladies. Catch it. He said, while he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Levi, the tribe, was still in the loins when Melchizedek met him. Mm. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but this is serious. And this is so important to remember that this, this Melchizedek, now you go through the book of Hebrews and you'll find right here, in, I believe just in the seventh chapter, chapter five, six, and seven, six times he keeps mentioning, thou art a priest, I have called thee, thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
I have called you after the order of Melchizedek. Mm. Wow. I have called you after the order. Six times, making sure that everybody knows he's not after the order of Levi. One who always existed and always will. Amen. He remains a priest forever. King of righteousness, king of peace. Melchizedek, Melchizedek is Christ incarnate. Amen. Amen. Said he was made, we saw him. He said he was made like the what? The son of God. Is that what we read somewhere? I said, is that what we read somewhere? He says, no end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. And folks, that's the same person that was in the fiery furnace. Yep. When they said, hmm, where did this fourth man came from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks like the Son of God. <laughs> what did they see? It's the same, the same person that came to Abraham in the tent when he, Abraham stood in the face of God. Remember, we read that? We were, we were studying this on Sunday, and we'll continue that. Was it Sunday? Was it last week? I think it was last week, last Wednesday. Huh? That's the same, listen, the same, the same person, the same person that came to Abraham while he was in the tent door, while three of them was on their way to destroy Sodom. And Abraham stood in the face of that one calling him Lord. That's the same person. Wow. You know what's interesting about this? Is that he was not necessarily recognizable, except his deity was recognizable. Huh? Well, I, I remember, uh, you remember the two men that was walking to the city of Emmaus? And Jesus caught up with them, and they didn't recognize him? So he show up any way he wants to and cause you, your, your, your uh, senses to be sustained that you can't recognize. Are you still with me? So here it is. Here, here, he, 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 Abraham... Uh, the covenant that he had with God was a unilateral covenant. How am I doing on time? Okay, I got about four minutes. The, the covenant that Abraham have, had with God was a unilateral covenant. It was a covenant of promise. And a unilateral covenant is a covenant where one person, one person, you know, usually in a covenant you got two people. And each of them have terms of the covenant. I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, and the other says, I'll do this, and I'll do this when you do, if you do that, right? That's called a bilateral covenant, where two people have, have contents, terms. But a unilateral covenant is when only one party gave the terms, okay. and the other just have to believe it. Amen. And it's the reason God put Abraham to sleep when he had the covenant. So he can't hear nothing, see nothing. When he woke up, he just had to believe. He said, what do I know? How do I know that I will be the father of many nations? And God says, all right, come here, come here, come here. Get a dove and get a, get a lamb and cut it in half. You remember the story? And when he did it, the place became dark, and God came down and smoke and flax, so to speak. Well, that's what the scripture says. And Abraham heard nothing, but God made all the promises. The details of the covenant, God gave it. And God says, all you have to, and the Bible says, and Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. All he had to do was believe. And that's called a, that's called a unilateral covenant, where the other party don't have any any anything in it, just say, okay, I receive it. Amen. So that means, it means that the covenant that God made with Abraham was a covenant of promise. 
He promised him. Remember, God says, I'll, I, there's two immutable things that God cannot lie. And he made this covenant, a covenant of promise. Oh, come on, church. You, you're still with me. Is, is, this, is this not too deep for you, is it? <laughs> Amen. That covenant was a covenant of promise. All he had to do was believe all the way through. He didn't have to do anything but just believe God. Mm. And so here, here we find... Uh, that went, so, so that's why <clears throat> the covenant of, uh, with Abraham of promise is grace, not the law. That's where grace really began for the human race. It's a covenant of grace. We're not under the law, but we're under grace. We're not under the law, but we're under grace. And when we tithe, we tithe under grace. Because we're not the, the, of the seed of Moses. We're the seed of Abraham. Are you listening to me? And the promise of the seed to Abraham was Christ. And when Christ came and we came into Christ, we're now connected to Abraham. So God bypassed the law, connected the Abraham covenant to the New Testament saints. And we're called the seed of Abraham, and all the promises God made to Abraham now belong to us. Amen. Amen. It had nothing to do with the Mosaic covenant. And that's a covenant of grace, a covenant of a unilateral covenant, a covenant of promise. And God said, I made you a promise, and he's not a man that he should lie. He says um, there's two immutable things that God cannot lie. And the two immutable things that is written here in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, is that he made an oath and he made a promise, and he cannot break it. He can't break it. And that's what immutable means. It, it means a promise and an oath. It means it cannot be broken. It means, it means it's... it's, it's, it's uh, uh, is not capable or susceptible to change. Can't change. And so he connected us to Abraham. So when we tithe, we don't tithe under the law, we tithe under grace. Just like Abraham tithed under grace. You see the picture? I said, do you see the picture? All right, we'll go to one more scripture and go back to the fifth chapter. We go back to the fifth chapter. And just look at, uh, boy, this is, this is so exciting. Let's, if you, if you, let's look at the beginning of verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. No, 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 no. But it was he who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also said in another place, you are a priest forever. Everybody say forever. forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. Verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he was offered up, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. That's Jesus, right? And was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Verse 10, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And now look at verse 11, of whom, that's Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. In other words, we've got to tell you about this Melchizedek, but you can't get it because you're dull of hearing. And look at verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the first principle of the oracles of God, and you have come to need of milk and not solid food. I want to tell you who this Melchizedek is, but he says it is hard to explain because you're dull of hearing, spiritually dull, and don't seem to listen. 
you have need of milk and not of strong meat. I want to tell you about this Melchizedek. I said it's hard to explain. Come on, well, some of you, did you catch it yet? If you didn't, it's hard to explain to you. <laughs> you need milk and not strong meat. You see, does it make sense to you? Can you see that? He's talking about Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain. In other words, this is the Christ. He was given the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Mm. Think. He still lives today. Amen. And every time we tithe, we're not tithing to the church. We're tithing to the priest who ever lives. And he is called the great high priest in heaven. Seated at the right hand of the Father, God has put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. That's you and I. He's the high priest. He still lives. We just read it more than once. He's forever, forever after the order of Melchizedek. He still lives. Every time we give, every time we bring, we don't give tithes, we return what belongs to God. That's what the Bible teaches, you know. Tithe, you don't, you're not paying your tithe. You're giving God what belongs to him. He did say the first fruit is mine, didn't he? I said, didn't he? Yeah. All right, this, we're giving him what belongs to him. And every time you do, you give him, he, he's the high priest. He's the one that says, okay. Well, wait a minute, he's not here physically, but he has representatives. He has his body, he has his church, he has his business. I must be about my father's business. And that's how you see it. You don't, you, you don't, this is not a covenant between you and the church. This is a covenant between you and God. This is a covenant between you and God. Every time you do, you are declaring that he lives. Declaring that he lives. It's a covenant. And I mentioned to you that covenant of the blood and the bread is not between you and me and God, the Father. The bread and the wine is not, that's not a covenant between me and you and God, you and God. That's the covenant between Christ and the Father. And that's why we have to be in Christ to receive the benefits of what that covenant provides. God, he didn't trust us with that. Uh, God didn't trust you and I making a covenant with us but he trusted his son. He was sinless. He was complete. He said he was perfected even through the things he suffered. He trusted his son to make a covenant with him. And he said, everybody that came to you and become in Christ, they're going to receive the benefit of what you've done. And I would look at each of them through you because you're perfect. Perfect in obedience. That's who the covenant is with. You think God made a covenant you and me? We wouldn't want to put our two cents in. You know, well, I, you know, I, yeah, I think you should do it this way. Yeah, I, I'll give you this, Lord, if you give me that. I'll do, uh, you know, no, no. He, 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 got, he, he, can, he don't trust us that way. But he trusts his son. And so he made the covenant with him. So when God spoke to Abraham and says, your son, I'll make a covenant with you and your seed, and he em emphasized, not seeds, as in plural, and your seed, and then it says, speaking of Christ. That's what it says. I make a covenant with you and your seed, speaking of Jesus, speaking of Christ, not us. Hello. And so when that covenant is made, thank God we're in Christ. Once we're in Christ, we can receive the benefit. The fight's already over. The benefits is made available to everybody that's in Christ. All the promises is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Amen. Every promise is yes and amen. Hallelujah. So please don't listen to the lies. And these lies, and you know, the reason it's lies is because of deception. I don't think these men and women deliberately trying to deceive the church, they're deceived themselves.
because they're not paying attention to what the scripture teaches. So they're not, I don't believe they're deliberately lying about it. You know what deception is? It's believing a lie. And who's the, who's the, who's the chief of liars? <laughs> Jesus said he lied from the beginning. No, no, he called him the father of lies. And it's called doctrines of devils and doctrines of men. So don't believe that hype. No, please don't believe that hype. If you want God to protect your stuff and protect your life and your goods and everything that he's blessed you with, everything that he promised to give you, it, it comes from the covenant tither. Because that's the only place he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He'll rebuke the devourer for my sake. So whatever it takes, don't you ever stop. Because when you stop, you just cut off what God can do and what it'll do for you when you get in trouble. Amen. Church said a better amen than that. Amen. Stand up on your feet with me, please. Stand on your feet. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus.